Good morning, good afternoon. I am Michael Owens. I am the executive producer of Health Spaces, and welcome to a new episode of The Pulse by Health Spaces. Now, today we have an excellent episode for you. We have a case study. Everybody loves case studies. And the topic is optimizing healthcare facilities using wireless technology, specifically Bluetooth. Now, you know, Bluetooth, that technology that allows you to stay on the phone with mom when you're in the car and then you go into the supermarket and you come back in and it works seamlessly. Amazing, right? Well, today we're going to be talking about how Bluetooth is actually utilized a lot more than that, specifically within healthcare environments. So we all know that Bluetooth does a lot more than that. It's basically a technology that works in the background behind a lot of the most advanced healthcare facilities without notice. So the wireless technology can be used to successfully integrate many of the critical devices and systems that power hospitals. So in this webcast, we'll be joined by leaders from Riverside Healthcare, Contact IO, and the Bluetooth SIG, who will provide real examples of how medical device tracking, indoor navigation, space utilization, and other location services are helping healthcare facilities optimize their operations and improve the care they provide patients. Now, before we get started and bring on our guests, I just want to go over the platform we're using today. It's called Big Marker. Maybe some of you have been inside here, of course, from our last episode or using it for another webinar. But we want this to be interactive. If you're tuning in live right now, you have the ability to ask questions. So if you have them for our guests, we want you to throw them into the chat or on this side, the chat throughout the discussion. I keep getting that wrong every time. Um, Right in the chat box, that's if you have any questions, comments, please put them in there. But also, I'd like you to direct you right now. We do have two polls that we'd like you to answer um, to get the conversation started. So there's two questions. One is, which sources of information do you rely on most when choosing a technology vendor for your RTLS system? And the other one is, what is the most important attribute you, when deploying an RTLS asset tracking solution? If this question is relevant to you, you understand what it's all about, we'd love to get your, your input and we'll come to those results a little bit later um, in, the, in the episode. And I can see them coming in right now. So um, there are a number of, of selections there. So um, you can take your time going in there and we'll come back to those. Um, so to go over how we're gonna format today's episode, we have three guests who are joining us. We have Chuck Sabin, he's a Senior Director of Market Development for Bluetooth SIG. We have Kapil Asher, who's Director of Healthcare IoT Solutions for Contact IO. And we're also going to be joined by Eric Devine, Chief Information Security Officer for Riverside Health. Now, we're going to speak to each guest individually for about eight to 10 minutes. Um, and then we're going to come together at the end for some questions. But like I said earlier, if you do have questions now or as they come up, please come at the, put them in, into the chat. That way we have them queued up when we come to the back end. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the screen our first guest. Our first guest, as I said, is Chuck Sabin. Chuck is a Senior Director of Market Development for Bluetooth SIG. Chuck, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great. Well, glad to see that the, our technology is working, but we're here to talk to you today yeah. about your technology, Bluetooth SIG. So can you give our audience, you know, of course, our audience is familiar with Bluetooth. It's, it's, it's part of our everyday life. But in particular, um, what is Bluetooth SIG, S-I-G? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, oftentimes people know the technology because of, of what they see on their phone. You know, they see the icon sitting on the phone or they've got a you know, particular device that, that, uh, that they utilize that shows the logo. But really, the, the Bluetooth technology and the Bluetooth Special Interest Group is a standards development organization. And we're the organization that is behind... Uh, the, the Bluetooth technology and servicing the companies and, and the, the member companies, as we like to say, that are utilizing the technology in their, in their products. You know, we're a global trade organization. We were established back in 1998. That's been you know, around for quite some period of time. Uh, we ultimately oversee the brand and, and service and, and manage the, the, the relationships with over 36,000 member companies uh, from a worldwide basis that are actually utilizing the technology for their particular products. Now, with that as an organization, we service those companies in very three very specific areas. Uh, one is around specification development and the process for development of new features. We provide the opportunities and the ability for companies to come together and collaborate on new features and new capabilities for the technology that you'll be hearing about uh, today. We also provide all of the test tools and the qualification process for that. 
as you can imagine, interoperability and the ability for, you know, hundreds and thousands of devices to be able to work together is an important aspect of what Bluetooth is actually delivering into the market. And so we provide the tests, the test tools, the qualification process that all of our members uh, and the companies adhere to in order to ensure that those devices will work together in a seamless manner. And then we also manage the brand. We manage the promotion, the delivery, and the the, the, the communication of the brand into a new uh, into new markets and, and into new uh, new opportunities in the in the market. So we uh, ultimately were the, the the heart behind the technology that ultimately goes into all the devices that the end users see at the end of the day. Excellent. Now, doing my research leading into this and understanding kind of the history of Bluetooth, we got Bluetooth, which everyone's remember, but there's Bluetooth. LE, can you explain to the audience, I guess, the difference between the two? Yeah, I think that, the, you know, the way that you hear it in the market is around what we would consider like Bluetooth Classic versus Bluetooth uh, Low Energy or Bluetooth LE. Uh, Bluetooth Cat Classic is essentially the original Bluetooth radio. Uh, it was designed for very specific purposes in terms of cutting the wires uh, associated with peripherals and audio devices and so on. And what was recognized by the membership and by companies that were that were relying on Bluetooth is that they needed one a an architecture that allowed for much lower power, which hence Bluetooth low energy, uh, but also an architecture that provided more flexibility to deliver all types of solutions uh, in, into the market. When you think about classic, there were probably five or six core solutions that were enabled through that uh, through that classic radio. But when you think about enabling the billions of devices that are, are talked about for the IoT, the Internet of Things, you know, our co member companies needed a much more flexible architecture in order to deliver uh, unique solutions for the situation, whether or not it's wearables or it's indoor location or uh, or uh, device networking for network lighting control solutions. You know, there was a there was a broad need in the market for a much more flexible architecture, and that's where you're seeing most of the development, most of the innovation on Bluetooth today is around that Bluetooth low energy radio. Low energy rating. Okay, so it's like Coke Classic and Diet Coke. You guys didn't want to do like classic Bluetooth and diet Bluetooth. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, diet was a, you know, you, that, that you, joke, that joke. yeah, exactly. But it's a, <laughs> it's, it is a, it is where all the innovation is happening. And as you're going to see from the, from the companies that are on the, on today, you know, they're using the cloud, the, 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 the low energy radio to help enable the, the solutions that they're delivering into the market. Yeah. So let's, let's, I'd like to talk to you about the growth of Bluetooth. I mean, it's, it's, can, I know we have a, a, a slide that we like to bring up here to kind of, to, to, to showcase that. Sure. Um, you know, the annual, annual growth, can you share with the audience uh, kind of that, that row in 6.4 billion annual shipments by 2025? Um, can you talk to this slide? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just very quickly on this one. I, I think the thing that, that we've recognized as for, from Bluetooth is that, you know, it's sort of unprecedented to degree to see such a steady growth of a technology, which ultimately is a is a testimony to the continued uses as well as the continued innovation that is happening in the technology. It is not really flattened. Now, you'll see that, you know, because of COVID, there was a the sort of a flattening of the curve back in in 2020 because mm -hmm. of decreased demand and, and a number of factors. But what you notice going forward is that as we come out of this pandemic, the growth continues for Bluetooth in, in, uh, in shipping of devices, leading up to the first time where today we're gonna do, this year we're gonna probably, remember about four and a half billion Bluetooth enabled devices this year alone. Right. And by 2025, that number will increase to about 6.4 billion per year uh, shipping that include uh, Bluetooth technology. What's interesting behind this, the, behind these numbers is that difference between that sort of light blue bar and the dark blue bar. And that is the difference between platform devices like your mobile phones that are, are shipping in the market. And then what you're seeing is the continued growth of connected devices that are uh, that are being utilized, that are utilizing Bluetooth technology. And, and that's really where the growth is coming is it's not in the mobile phone market. It's actually in all of the connected devices that may be connected to phones, maybe connected to laptops or, 
or solutions and systems in inside smart buildings or hospitals and, and so on. And that growth is just continuing to expand. Well, perfect. Perfect segue then, because I know, again, most of us all think of Bluetooth. We think of data and voice, um, but of course, Bluetooth is connecting a lot more than, than that. So what are some of the other primary uses of the technology um, that, 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 that we, you know, people don't really or may not be aware of? Yeah, you know, that's it. It's interesting. You know, when you when you say Bluetooth, most people will, you know, they'll hold their hand up to their to their ear and they'll they'll recognize it as the phone or my headset. You know, some people will recognize it as the wearables like your smart watches and, and fitness devices and so on that are are delivering, uh, you know, that are utilizing Bluetooth. And that's what most people will recognize. And and rightly so. Right. The audio streaming, which is one of the solution areas that we that we deliver the technology for, is the largest uh, solution area for for Bluetooth technology. But that's very quickly followed by data transfer, which is really your wearable technologies that are there's a significant amount of advancement going on in that solution area. But two sort of lesser known, but fastest growing uh, solution areas for Bluetooth is in location services and device networks, many of which are the solution areas that are going to be used in the use cases that we're going to talk about today, where you got location services where Bluetooth is being used for asset tracking, navigation, indoor wayfinding, and various access control capabilities, and device networks where Bluetooth is now being used for network lighting control and, uh, and, and automation solutions in industrial applications, smart building applications, and others as well. And, and this is a, you know, these are, they're, they're maybe lesser known and, and maybe lesser in volume, but they are our fastest growing solution areas for how the technology is being used uh, uh, going forward in the, in the future. Yeah, I'm just looking at those numbers too. I mean, 770 million uh, devices shipped just on, on the controls there is, is, is fascinating just to see the technology. And yeah. to see the and to see the and to see the growth, um, so you know, in particular, of course, our audience for health spaces are healthcare facilities, um, design, engineering, operations leaders. Beyond wearables and health, right? Because that's what you mentioned before. Everyone thinks about that. What are some ways that Bluetooth devices are impacting healthcare facilities? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And and you know, to your point, you know, Bluetooth has become this sort of go to technology for for wearables in in health and fitness and. And that's ultimately translating into broader usages for uh, for uh, um, healthcare solutions. Uh, but beyond things like patient monitoring that are that are using Bluetooth technology, areas that we are actually seeing uh, significant growth in and contact IO will we'll, we'll talk about this as well are areas around occupancy management. Uh, you know, one of the things about the the pandemic has been looking at how do you safely uh, manage people within a within a building or within a within a, um, a location, and so occupancy management and heat mapping and and uh, sort of safe routing solutions are ones that are are really sort of uh, um, uh, setting the tone for how location services can ultimately be used in a context of not only a smart building but in healthcare as well, where you're trying to keep people safe. You're trying to keep people moving in the right direction. You're trying to manage against the, 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 the regulations that might be coming down from local governments in terms of how you manage space within your, uh, within your, your building. You know, these are all sort of from facilities perspective are technologies that can help manage those types of, of, uh, of scenarios. We're also seeing the technology being used in, in health screening applications hygiene and, and sanitation management and making sure that the facilities are are clean or that individuals are adhering to the hygiene strategies that are associated with a, a building or a facility. And ultimately also then, as I mentioned before with the, 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 um, uh, the device networking type capabilities, touchless control and touchless management and, and sensors has been a big part of delivery into a number of these facilities and having those solutions networked together over wireless technology has been sure. a, uh, a, uh, a specific way of how you can actually manage those types of solutions. And so we're seeing Bluetooth technology managed and, and deployed in those types of solutions as well. Yeah. Well, I just want to go to the, to the poll questions here, because um, one of them we asked uh, is, which source of information do you rely on when choosing a technology vendor for like something like an RTLS? 
And the number one answer was a technology standards organization. So that's uh, obviously a good one there. And then coming in, we uh, we spent a lot of time working on the resources and the and that many companies need for uh, for um, understanding solutions, finding companies that are delivering solutions against what they uh, their their the the needs that they have, but also just generally speaking, understanding the technology and and understanding you know how the technology can be used in applications that are that are specific to their operation. Yeah, and the number two resource, of course, is vendors, which we're going to be talking to one next. Mm-hmm. But before we move on to our next guest, I guess you know since you're with Bluetooth Sig, um, you know what what do you hope are the key takeaways that you want people to get out of this episode today? Oh, that's a that, well, that's a great question. I, I think the, the the big thing I want people to 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 understand here is that the technology is being utilized today, right? Oftentimes, when people again, as I mentioned before, when people think about Bluetooth, they say. You know, oh, you mean that that technology that I use for my phone connected to my car, and and the answer is yes to that to that question. But we have a significant uh, um, a number of companies that are using the technology uh, in the architecture that's been developed in order to deliver solutions that that maybe you didn't know before. And if I was thinking, you know, anything you're getting out of this, it's a better understanding of how the technology is being used for things like facilities management. Uh, and and indoor location and and various other uh, asset management tracking uh, solutions as well. And I think that's the great reason. That's the reason why it was so great to have actual use cases and vendors on the call itself to help explain and express how that's actually being used. Yeah, wonderful. And I, I also want to just before we bring up our next guest, we do have a sticky um, in the in the chat, which is the 2021 um, Bluetooth market update report. So we encourage everyone to download that to learn more about Bluetooth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we bring everybody back at the end for, for Q&A. So if you have any questions, again, as I mentioned for Chuck, put them in there now and for our other guests. But Chuck, we'll see you on the back end of this episode. Thanks for, for giving us some background on Bluetooth SIG. And now we're going to bring on our next guest, who is Kapil Asher. He's a director of healthcare IoT solutions for Contact IO. Kapil, can you hear me fine? Hey, I can. Can you? Yeah, yeah, great. Well, awesome. well, thanks, thanks for joining. So, you are a what I guess a member partner of Bluetooth, sure. right? Is that the correct uh, terminology? That is correct. Yep, correct. that is correct. Well, great. So, can you tell, explain to the audience a little bit about your organization, Contact IO? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, Contact IO is a enterprise indoor location services as well as IoT platform company. Uh, we develop our products. Uh, for uh, keeping the enterprise grade uh, functionality in mind, but we designed it with the principles of uh, consumer electronics. So that's the reason why uh, we've selected Bluetooth uh, protocol as well as Wi-Fi for data backhaul as our base layer of technology on top of which we build our own sensors. Uh, we build our own tags and gateways and uh, environmental monitoring sensors. Uh, that uh, provide specific contextual data to our customers. Uh, and we have uh, segmented our business into four major verticals, healthcare being one of the top, uh, education followed closely, uh, manufacturing and smart buildings. So carpet, carpeted spaces let, um, as, a, as the fourth vertical. Um, so we've been in business for almost uh, eight years now. And we have about 3.5, almost uh, 3.8 million beacons out in the world, uh, mm-hmm. which we are, um, you know, which we have deployed uh, through our thousand plus uh, partners uh, who mm-hmm. take our products and kind of make niche applications for their customers, um, as well as uh, we have about uh, 30,000 applications out there in the field. Okay, so you just referenced your your number of markets, of course, but today we're we're mm-hmm. speaking to the healthcare market. Um, sure. Can you? Can you share with the audience what specific challenges do your solutions solve um, in the healthcare vertical? Absolutely. So uh, in the healthcare vertical, uh, some of the biggest challenges that we help uh, solve is the reducing patient, uh, I mean, improving patient uh, productivity. So just imagine a hospital that's about 325 beds. It's got about a million plus square feet of uh, real estate. And it has about fifteen to 20,000 mobile assets that are just uh, moving all around the whole hospital, right? 
when a particular nurse requires one of these devices to treat patient stat, uh, they have generally no idea where to look for that asset, right? Uh, it could be an IV pump, it could be a specialty bed, it could be a, a wheelchair stretcher, um, you know, uh, well, we're talking about SCDs, wound wax. There are so many of these devices uh, which are just floating around the whole hospital without any visibility. So we help uh, get the nurses to their uh, medical devices uh, in a much faster manner by putting our location services on top of the on, off top of the devices as well as uh, using our software. Uh, the second uh, challenge is uh, utilization. So because of lack of visibility, it's a very common tendency for hospitals to over procure medical devices, to over procure uh, and rent devices that they don't necessarily need to meet demand, but just because of the virtue of not being able to find them, they like to keep a buffer quantity. So we could help alleviate that extra capital expenditure, which uh, was not needed in the first place. Uh, then a uh, few of the patient and staff related challenges we solve is with uh, inefficient patient workflows. So when patients come in, they're generally not aware of where to go to meet their doctor. Uh, even when they come in, there is a long wait time because, uh, you know, there is a backlog of uh, uh, patients that have come in earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it just becomes a, a, a nightmare trying to figure out what is the most optimized workflow to improve these uh, patients flow through their uh, different phases of care. And then finally, um, you know, staff duress, we know, you know, one out of four nurses uh, tend to get attacked by patients. So we help them with a wearable that can alert a security person as soon as possible uh, by press of a button. And then finally, environmental monitoring. So we do help with energy optimization within the building by monitoring things like heat, uh, I mean, temperature, humidity, air quality, um, you know, smoke detection, all of those things that can help the facilities management uh, within the hospital uh, operate their buildings in a much efficient manner. Great, great. And I know after, when, we're, when we wrap up here, we're going to be speaking with uh, Riverside yeah. Healthcare, which I know you guys are working with. But in total, I mean, how many hospital or healthcare organizations are you currently working with? Uh, we have in various capacities, we have more than 50 hospitals right now in North America alone. And uh, globally, I think that number might be close to 100. OK, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So getting, you know, getting into so real time location services, I guess, is not necessarily new to healthcare. Sure. So what's specifically unique, you know, about contact uh, IO, um, you know, in, in that in that uh, realm? Absolutely. So you're right. Real time location sensing has been around for at least 10 years, if not more like 15. Uh, the challenge is, is like any other technology that was first uh, introduced, right? Uh, companies come up with a great idea. And they kind of write, like to proprietize their technology, right? There's a communications protocol between different sensors and their own infrastructure mm -hmm. devices, which is understandable only between that ecosystem. Uh, if you bring in a sensor from outside, uh, it becomes very difficult for these companies to understand what the sensors are saying because it's used uh, a proprietary protocol to begin with. It did not use an open standards protocol. Uh, so uh, what that does is it gives some monopolistic uh, uh, nature to these businesses, right? Because they have their own ecosystem, which they've developed using their own sensors, using their own infrastructure. They can maintain a high price. They can maintain a certain uh, level of, uh, uh, you know, cost associated with deploying these systems because there's no, no other competition. There's no one else challenging the status quo and help driving the cost down. Um, so what has been expected so far uh, within the marketplace has always been about, uh, give me a turnkey solution, give me a low cost system, which is low cost across the board. The sensors are uh, inexpensive, the infrastructure is inexpensive, maintaining these systems is inexpensive, uh, but they get the short end of the stick, right? They end up with, um, you know, these forest of different disparate networks that don't talk to each other uh, without having to build these expensive integrations and interfaces between the multiple data pipes. Uh, then I, I told, I spoke about monopolistic and, you know, we all know monopolism is not very good for industry progress. 
uh, because it lacks innovation, it lacks um, cost competition, and it just kind of stunts the industry from growing and accepting new products coming into the marketplace. Uh, so all of this, uh, you know, results into a hard to manage system. And uh, with a hard to manage systems comes the high cost of uh, deploying it. So, so far the RDLS, uh, traditional legacy RDLS industry has been able to penetrate only, I would say 20 to 30% of the healthcare market in the North American region. And only the rich hospitals, like we would say, uh, are able to afford it. Uh, but we know the need is there for the, the lower tier hospital, the regional community hospitals, uh, but they are just not able to justify the cost within their organization. So at Contact IO, using these open standards, we are going to break the shackles and, and let these uh, lower tier hospitals also take advantage of RTLS. Well, that, that's that's a good thing you brought that up because, as we're all well aware, of, especially now coming out of COVID, a lot of healthcare organizations are strapped with capital. So anything mm -hmm. that's you know, it's a nice to have thing for a lot of lives. Right. So where do you see in terms of the opportunity for the cost of the technology coming down? I mean, in the next couple of years, do you see it like everything else just getting more accessible? Absolutely. So, like Chuck mentioned, we have about the target of shipping Bluetooth chips by 2025 is. Uh, 6.5 billion, I believe he said. Uh, just imagine the amount of R&D money that goes into it, the amount of economics of scale you can achieve uh, within these chips itself, right? You're talking about making it cheaper, uh, more uh, improved performance, better with power consumption and power management. So they can, these chips can operate on a very low uh, energy consumption rate, which helps improve the, the battery life of the sensors that we develop. And if you improve the battery life, you have to maintain these devices le uh, lesser. Uh, traditional uh, sensors and tags uh, used to have a battery life of about one to two years. And our you know, basic uh, uh, technology sensor and tag uh, comes in uh, at four years battery life. So if we get uh, more power efficient chips in the future, uh, we can expand our battery lives to six, eight years in the future and reduce your maintenance cost uh, from an operation standpoint, right? So um, that's one of the opportunities I see where the cost will go down. And second, I wanted to mention is that we are completely cloud-based. Um, so initially, uh, RTLS systems were on-premise on based. Uh, so you yeah. required a virtual server, you required a, a hard server in many cases, and you have to get your IT department to keep maintaining that service on an annual basis. Sure. All of that goes away. Now we can you know, shift that uh, work all the way to our uh, friends at Amazon and Microsoft, and they take care of the service, and we don't have to worry about it. OK, that, that's great. So in, 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 we talked a lot about, see, about RTLS. What about the full suite of things that, that contact? Can, can, I guess, can you share with the audience kind of some of the other things that, that you guys offer? Absolutely. So, well, we so like I mentioned in my opening statement, right? We are we are not just a, a real time location sensing company, but we are an IoT platform company, right? So we are using Bluetooth as our core technology, which is open standard, like Chuck mentioned. Uh, and and the 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 um, opportunities are unlimited, right? Once we have our infrastructure devices, our gateways. Uh, which are able to uh, communicate with other Bluetooth sensors out in the market, uh, we can extract data from anything. We can extract data from uh, an IV pump, an infusion pump, and get uh, information out of it with respect to maintaining it. Like, so it, how long was it kept on for? How long was it in operation? Are there any sort of alerts on the medical device that need to be addressed very soon? Uh, is there a corrective maintenance on the pump or is there a, a you know, a, a preventative maintenance on the pump? All of these things we can intake within our uh, cloud dashboard and kind of send that data out using our open APIs to multiple different user applications. Uh, and, and just by democratizing all of this data, uh, we can essentially create the pipe between the medical device, bet uh, with, between the sensor all the way to the dashboards that the end user ends up using um, and, and do it at a very cost-effective manner. So that's kind of where uh, the company is going to head in the future. Well, great. Obviously, people can learn about it at contact.io. 
um, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll drop that into the chat too um, if, if people don't know the, the correct spelling for, for the audience so they know where, where to go to learn more. Yeah, it is K O N T A K T. So just the word contact, but replace all the C's with the K's. And okay. uh, dot IO is the is the name of the company. Okay, I knew it, but I want to make sure I didn't mess it up. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I know it's. Uh... Before we bring on our next guest, um, I do have one more question for you. I guess to sure. set that up. But again, if you have any questions uh, for Kapil, for Chuck, and obviously for next one, put them in. I do see we have a couple of questions. There's some good ones. We will get to those in the end. Um, but, you know, segging into the, in, into bringing on Riverside Health, can you, I guess, can you share with us a, a brief intro into the work that you guys are doing with them? Absolutely. So Riverside uh, Healthcare uh, and Eric Devine, uh, they were uh, looking for an RTLS uh, vendor for quite some time uh, before we got introduced to them. And we did a, a, a very good presentation and a demonstration for them. And, and Eric was very happy with what we had to say, uh, say and do. Uh, but their challenge was uh, revolving around patient development. Uh, they have some, uh, and Eric will obviously talk greater details about it, but uh, they had some challenges with patient wandering and elopement, and they wanted us to provide a solution for that so we can, uh, you know, uh, stop that from happening and making the patients uh, enter a dangerous situation they don't want to be. And then that expanded into more of an asset tracking solution where we are helping the biomed uh, engineers and clinical engineers to stay on top of their preventative maintenance by helping them search for medical devices in a much faster manner. So, um, you know, Eric is obviously uh, going to speak uh, more in detail about it. All right. Eric, is everything he's saying, is he telling the truth? <laughs> yeah, he's not a liar. All right. <laughs> well, Kapil, we'll come back to you in the back end, right. but Eric, uh, welcome. Thank you. Good to, good to have you here with us. So, Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so I'm glad that we were able to set this up where we had Bluetooth kind of give the, the story of the where the technology is and have Kapil sure. as the vendor. But of course, I know our audience is really interested to hear from the healthcare systems uh, sure. uh, background. So before we get started, can you just give uh, give a little background on yourself and, and your role at Riverside? Sure. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I've been the chief information security officer here at Riverside for the last nine years. I've been in IT and cybersecurity since 94, so it's been a long trek. Um, been here for 10 years. Uh, I really have taken on a, a new role in the cybersecurity realm in healthcare, been in a lot of different uh, venues there. Uh, but they decided that cybersecurity really deals a lot with electronics and technologies of healthcare. So they, they started putting me in that responsibility as well. And then, uh, then all of a sudden it was clinical engineering knowing how much cybersecurity huh. is affecting the medical devices. So uh, that's where I was uh, in charge there. Great, great. So obviously I want to get into the work that you guys have been doing with contact. And sure. I guess let's start from the beginning. What sure. was the, you know, what was the initial motivation behind starting the IoT project at Riverside? Uh, honestly, it was uh, patient elopement. Um, the CNO, the chief nervous officer uh, and staff was saying that uh, we really want to eliminate uh, patient elopement, uh, patients leaving, whether it be on purpose or, or uh, on accident, I guess you can say. Um, and, and the challenge is that if there's two words in healthcare I can come together with is, is expensive and stressed, <laughs> uh, especially in these times. So the we can't rely on nurses have so much to do. Uh, and we're such shortage of nurses that, you know, sometimes you can't keep an eye on a patient that seems to be stable and suddenly wants to get up because they're thirsty or they're hungry or they're looking for somebody that may or may not be there. And we needed a system that really took on the uh, ability to uh, augment the nurse and the care sitter's uh, abilities. So we really looked at uh, other avenues of using um, kind of a patient elopement system. And when I came into the, to the discussion, I, you know, hate saying this, but I'm like, you know, really a patient is no different than an asset. Uh, it's an asset to the hospital. It's an asset to uh, the organization. It's an asset to the family. So why can't we use, uh, I've been looking at RTLS for years. Um, why can't we use an RTLS system rather than our standard, you know, uh, other systems that are maybe a little more legacy, uh, proprietary and expensive. Uh, how can we utilize RTS to RTLS to really uh, find patients when they, when they're not where they're supposed to be? Um, so that's really where it started. And then knowing clinical engineering and being responsible for it, I said, how can we help augment my staff to get PMs done on time? You know, it, yeah. we have well over 10,000 devices. Um, how do we manage that? 
how do we know where they're at? How can we lessen the time of an engineer looking for a device to PM it or to just see where it's at? And then it grew to that saying, how can a nurse or a clinician find that device? So it becomes a patient safety issue. How do you quickly eliminate that zero, uh, that lead time to find a device, a pump, uh, whatever, maybe a hover mat, uh, even a wheelchair? How do you make that so it's so incredibly easy for the nurse or clinician or staff member to find that where a patient's not waiting for, for care? You know, mm-hmm. and, and if your hospital is not uh, primary focus is patient safety, I don't know what you're doing in this business. So anything that we look at technology has to be a patient safety factor. Now, I don't know if you said, if you stated this, when did this start? When did this project start? Um, it started, uh, it started this year, um, uh, okay. you know, obviously budgeting and, and, you know, getting all the numbers together and, but, and all that right. stuff last year, but we really started this, uh, at the beginning, probably end of last year, December timeframe, uh, all the way till, uh, we keep expanding it. Um, you know, the, the core of the system really finished in about, uh, I'd say six weeks. Um, and then we just started expanding the, the, you know, the asset tagging. Sure. So obviously anything like this is trying to, you know, it's a solution. So trying to solve a problem. So again, what was the key problem that was the, the, the most important thing? And then were the secondary things that, you know, were, I guess, um, you know, things that could wait if necessary that you were trying right. to solve when you, when you deployed it. Well, it depends on who you ask because nothing ever <laughs> wins in technology, right? Everybody yeah. has a different opinion. There's too many chefs in the kitchen sometimes, but really it was the patient safety. I mean, that's going to drive anything that we do in technology and cybersecurity and, and clinical engineering. Uh, how do we alleviate the elopement of a patient, whether it be on purpose or, or helping them? So it's, it doesn't become a safety issue. Um, that was the primary focus by far, and it always will be. Uh, patient safety to me is a, a huge endeavor. Uh, I don't do anything without thinking about patient safety. Um, the asset tagging was obviously our, our secondary, you know, and, and real close to the primary, but um, the time and the evaluation of where things are at, how they're being used, if there's a collection of devices sitting in a closet that we need access to uh, quickly, and not just from a clinical engineering standpoint, but from any staff member or clinician, uh, how do we make that really easy? So those were the two primary goals. And then when you wrap that around with, you know, everything else, it's got to be ease of administration, uh, ease of uh, use. It's got to be be able to adapt quickly because we don't have a lot of resource to sure. delve into RTLS as most healthcare systems don't. I mean, if you do, that's great. Um, but we needed something very flexible, very fast, very uh, easy to use. I mean, that's number one. And obviously, budget's going to rain over that. So cost effectiveness is, is key. Sure. Yeah. So on the deployment side, you know, as you mentioned, especially in a COVID environment this past year, right? stress burnt out and everything, taking Absolutely. on new things is not something at the top of the list for many people. So right. um, when you were deploying this, you know, was it hard to deploy? Um, no. how, how hard was it once the software integration was done? Um, I, I think really the... the- the really the um, the biggest compl- or complaint I have is on my own staff is deciding what we're going to tag first. <laughs> Everyone had an opinion and it, it was just like, OK, we really got to prioritize who's going to take that priority coming up with a plan. Uh, working with Contact IO, it was uh, incredibly simple. Um, they helped set us up the, the software in, in days, if not, it was maybe a week. Um, the, they kind of pre-programmed the tags to work with our system. I think there was some, you know, discovery that we had to do for a few weeks. Um, but once the devices shipped, it was, you plug them in, you get them, they're connected, you, you get them mapped and you essentially start testing it and you just tweak, you know, it's, it's a very simple process. I think, sure. you know, we're at, uh, I believe we're about 2,500 assets and we're starting to test on the patient elopement piece. Mm-hmm. Um, which is going very smoothly. I I think it's, uh, you know, that's the win. Did you, now, did you hire a third party to install the beacons and the gateway infrastructure? You did it internally? I did it all internally. Yeah, it was, it literally was two staff members that went around a, uh, you know, um, five stories, but not only did we do it north, south, uh, I think a big win for us was east, west. You know, we have clinics across five different counties in Illinois. Um, To just have an exciter or a gateway sitting at the door of a clinic we can know that a device entered that clinic. It could be a pump, it could be a wheelchair, whatever it may be. But just to know that, hey, that's not in the hospital anymore. That's in another building. Um, we're not wasting our time trying to find it here. We're, you know, we have a large campus uh, uh, right in, in Illinois. But um, just to know east-west location too, it, it it was really easy to set up. I mean, I had no wow. outside help at all. 
All right. So the next question I have was, did the, you know, looking back on the deployment, you know, would you change anything or anything go, go difficult, but it was pretty seamless from what it sounds like. I think pre-planning is probably is, I always look at pre-planning it's like, how can you, um, now, you know, hindsight's 2020, sure. I don't have any issues with dealing with contact IO as a vendor or their product or their technology. I think I had more of a, how do I integrate more, uh, departments into deciding a factor of what is important to them and then coming up with a plan to make a, here is my one to three year plan rather than, okay, we have two major problems. Let's fix those two major problems. And then, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. You know, mm -hmm. I've always had a, a idea of where it could go, but I think I needed better integration from my own, my own uh, departments. Great. So I, I want to talk about metrics, success metrics. I mm -hmm. mean, what are, do you have any key metrics for measuring the success of this deployment? Um, actually it, we have time spent on finding pumps. Um, it has an integration piece into our uh, uh, customer management platform or our help desk ticket, however you want to say it, but uh, has that integration piece. And so far we've, um, uh, I know it's never easy to say, but we've able to repurpose an FTE almost a uh, full-time employee uh, 40 hours a week um, that was just looking for PM maintenance parts, uh, oh, wow. pumps, EPCA. We were able to save an entire uh, uh, full-time employee for the year and repurpose that to a different position where they are now being more pro, uh, more uh, efficient for the organization and uh, more helpful to the team. So it's, that in itself was a huge and win. And I'm sure happier that they're not looking for things. <laughs> right. Sorry. I mean, I never want to say what they're called. There's a term in clinical engineering, apparently what they're called. It's not uh, appropriate, but um, they're much more happier not having to waste time. And sure. I, I'm from a, a, a efficiency standpoint. I mean, engineers are inexpensive uh, employees. They're not, I'm not paying someone just to go find stuff. Um, it's, it, it's incredible how much time we have saved. Sure. So just one final question before we bring everybody in for the group, uh, you know, looking to the future, um, what is the, you know, some of your roadmap items, leveraging the investment you've yeah. already made? Sure. Uh, uh, patient key. wayfinding. Yeah. Patient wayfinding is big in a hospital I and mean, hospitals are large organization, large hotels that are very complicated, complicated to somebody who's coming in new. Um, so wayfinding for the patient, um, we're looking at uh, uh, integration into our EMR uh, for next year. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, patient workflow and uh, clinician workflow can be gathered from the EMR and information for that to help uh, family members and or uh, staff of Riverside Healthcare. And, and finally, I'm really looking at um, how, you know, you go into an outpatient clinic and what's the one thing you do is you sit and wait. You know, you sit and wait for the vitals and then you sit and wait for the doctor and then you sit and wait for the nurse and then you sit and wait for discharge. How can we use RTLS so the entire uh, clinic knows where that patient is at in the system? So the moment they walk in, they get a badge. At that point, they can they can look at and say, okay, that patient's been waiting three minutes. We need to get them in the back. The uh, tech needs to get those vitals ASAP. Then once the vitals are done, that the, the clinician's pinged and then the clinician comes in or the nurse, you know, it should be a very quick flow. So that not only will... Uh, improve sa patient satisfaction and safety, but then we can actually see more patients in the day. Uh, and and with COVID and everything, it's it's become absolutely insanity at best. I don't know how. Else sure. to put it. So yeah. I, I think that would be a big win for RTLS. You know, patient workflow with the clinician workflow. Excellent. Excellent. Times. Well, thank thank thanks for 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 giving uh, you know some insights on how you guys have been utilizing the technology. We've got a, a number of good questions that I want to get to here as well, and we've got about 15 minutes. So I'd like to bring everybody back onto the screen. Um, you guys all still there? You didn't leave us? Yeah. Um, no, we're still here. Well, thanks. And, and thanks. Thanks to the audience for, for some good questions. If you have any additional ones, please put them in. Um, you know, the first one I want to get to is that we just heard a very good use case, uh, you know, from Riverside, from Eric here. So Chuck, coming back to you, since uh, we haven't heard from you for, for a good half hour now, is this this type of technology use being used in mass right now i mean are, do you, is it still kind of at the infancy stage within healthcare uh, i think that well this is kind of where you're 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 getting to the point of of you're seeing it already right you're 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 seeing it through eric's explanation of kind of where he's going and and what he's doing with the with the solution from contact io right the 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 forecast for kind of where this is going is that you know, we're going to see hundreds of thousands of different RTLS type solutions deployed in the healthcare field, you know, over the next, you know, several years. 
Uh, and it's because of this type of momentum. It's because of the types of benefits that Eric was just talking about that you're gonna you're gonna see these deployments happening faster and faster. And I know I mentioned the the pandemic before, but if the pandemic the pandemic has done anything, it's actually identified and and isolated this issue around efficiency and and patient management and patient monitoring and the efficiencies that are necessary in an organization in order to be able to uh, um, see the number of patients that are are coming through the system relative to uh, you know trying to support a pandemic and and so if anything what we've seen from companies that we've talked to is that there's actually an of deployments and an acceleration of, of testing and delivery of these deployments because of the highlighted need. It's just suddenly the urgency has become much greater and the recognition of the benefit has, has suddenly become more clear. And I think that's what Eric was sort of identifying and, and, and that's where this is really taking off. Great. So getting, getting to an audience question here, I'm gonna read it off my Bluetooth enabled device. Um, <laughs> several organizations are producing standards for RTLS and healthcare scenario. What is a likely adoption by suppliers to overcome the interoperability issue? I guess the, the longstanding question with any technology is interoperability. Uh, Kapil, I don't know, would you yeah. like to speak to that? Absolutely. So uh, I think a, a lot of standardization is already happening, right? So you have um, access control, I mean, access point companies, uh, wireless uh, companies like Cisco, Aruba, uh, you know, Juniper, Extreme, they're all a uh, putting BLE uh, modules within their access points uh, and making that as their standard IoT uh, protocol, right? So whereas Wi-Fi was doing for data and voice, uh, now BLE is doing the same thing for uh, sensor data intake. Uh, so, you know, when, when you have such big giant companies putting all their uh, efforts into incorporating those standard protocols within their esteemed products, uh, you know that that's the that's what is going to take off, right? That's that's going to be uh, the common denominator of everything that happens uh, in the future with IoT. So that's uh, that's something we have recognized um, way early in our uh, you know our journey of contact IO and adopted that to be our own uh, standard as well. Great, great, uh, Eric. There's a couple of questions for you specifically about talking about tracking healthcare devices and patients. Sure. What, secu what security standards do you follow and both on the Bluetooth side and the backend system? Um, you know, on the Bluetooth side, um, we try to stay with 4.2 and above. We're trying to stay with that security model uh, and not the legacy that 4.0 and below brings. So we try to stick with that. We really are focused on, there's two focuses we use on a cybersecurity perspective and that's the eavesdropping, which is, you know, it's mitigated with 4.2, but um, we're also using a lot of uh, technology around man in the middle. Um, segrega uh, segregation in the network is also uh, a very popular tool that we use here at Riverside, along with whitelisting and, and talking to, you know, making sure that we have strict protocol filters on the firewall. So um, is it a standard? Um, you know, I, I do, yeah, we do file standards no different than it kind of falls in a lot of different standards, even from PCI all the way to NIST. Um, and typically we try to stay around NIST or ISO, um, and, and those standards are, are, are pretty much across the Bluetooth as well. So a lot of segregation, a lot of, uh, you know, filtering and, uh, firewalling between making sure that this Bluetooth device, that talks to the wireless, you know, those are, we all firewall those off and make sure that only these ports, only these protocols, only these IP addresses are being talked to. Um, you know, that's, that's typically what we do in the, in the security realm of things and trying to. Uh, secure the devices and the, the Bluetooth uh, beacons that attach to the network. Great. And I guess one, one more follow up, uh, I guess, question right through all of you um, is can can the guests expand on patient wayfinding and where they see that going? Um, so I know, Eric, you said that you were talking about wayfinding. So maybe where you see that going and, and, and the rest of you can chime in. Sure. I think it's um, wayfinding is probably going to I really like to see it integrate into your patient access, which is usually your EMR, but may not be. Um, how do you get a patient who can check in from their phone now before they even walk into the hospital or a patient clinic, uh, get the information where they're at, know exactly where they're at in the healthcare, how to get there quickly, how long it would take them to get there. Um, sometimes you can walk across a campus and it takes you 10 minutes. 
um, especially in the larger medical institutions that are, are downtown Chicago. Um, how do you, how can we utilize the Epic integration that we have with Epic Systems or CERN or any other EMR you use to feed that to the system of Bluetooth, to feed that to a personal device where that personal device can help them guide them to getting to their place where they need to be faster. Um, one thing we're also looking at very closely is how close hospitals are becoming hotels. How can we uh, improve the experience of the family members and or the patient uh, for a room service? You know, um, we were looking at an option to, um, you know, being able for an employee to know where a staff member is at to deliver drinks or, or uh, food uh, that they've ordered online. So how can we be more of a hospitality uh, solution and not just a healthcare solution for the family members and guests of Riverside and other areas as well? Wonderful, wonderful. So I have a question just from a little bit earlier, and I'm not going to pretend that I understand it, but I'm guessing that maybe, Chuck, you can speak to this one. Uh, will smartphones implement multiple antennas for AOA, AOD, or will the multiple antennas always be needed on the end device, device being found? Uh, well, that, they, I, that's an that's a interesting question. It's a very specific question. Yeah. Uh, you know, something maybe Kapil can also uh, answer as well. But there are different models for how location services are, are implemented using Bluetooth. Uh, you know, some of it's proximity based in terms of, you know, how near is a, a device from one to another. And then there are, are um, capabilities for direction finding. And when you think about direction finding, it's more about, you know, in what direction is the is the device located or in what direction am I relative to another direction? And there are antenna designs that are associated with that. And I'm not going to claim to be an expert on antenna design. There's there's too many other people that are that are really focused on that. And it can be either be implemented through the, the 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 sensors in the ceiling or it can be implemented through the the mobile phone. I uh, generally the sensors that are sensors and and uh, and and antennas that are through the, the the elements that are in the ceiling are generally for asset tracking type solutions. Uh, so there is no need necessarily for the phone to have multiple antennas for that type of implementation uh, or the or the the asset that's being tracked uh, in that way. Uh, around if for but for indoor wayfinding type solutions that's where you may need and may want additional antennas on the on the phone itself and and that kind of implementation uh, is uh, is ultimately then uh, for the user to be able to then be be able to see their relative location on an indoor positioning solution uh, but contact IO might have some different takes on how to manage that uh, that implementation either from an indoor positioning versus a an asset tracking solution yeah so uh, again even i'm not an antenna design expert by by uh, any means but one of the things i would like to mention is uh, you know the the lowest level uh, location accuracy does come from the radio frequency and the antenna uh, from the tags from the mobile phones from the infrastructure devices uh, but uh, we overlay that accuracy with our own machine learning as well as artificial intelligence algorithms as well. Uh, so, you know, the, your guests should not discount the fact that there are software methods of improving your location accuracy as well uh, by keeping reference beacons in the environment, uh, by comparing the signal strength that you get from reference beacons versus uh, a movable beacon or a phone. And all of this uh, data is being processed at the edge of our devices. Uh, and this edge computing, just by the virtue of machine learning and how inexpensive the chips have become for uh, ML AI kind of uh, uh, technology, uh, that gives us a million data points to go after and then come up with a, a best estimated location for anything. Uh, so yeah, just combined with both of those, I think it's going to just get improved uh, on a daily basis. Wonderful. And uh, we just have a few minutes left, but there's one question specifically around power requirements. Are there any specific max transmit power requirements that should be observed in hospital environments? I don't know if anybody can answer that one. Uh, I, I can answer that one. I don't think there is a... I don't think for the use cases that we have described today, uh, we are worried about hitting any max power threshold, uh, either dictated by FCC or by any clinical grade, uh, uh, you know, radio frequency bodies out there. 
Uh, we maintain our beacon powers in the middle range somewhere uh, that goes both on asset tags as well as the, uh, the, the infrastructure beacons. So, and we achieve very good results with that. So I don't think we are overburdening or maximizing power on our devices to uh, become alarming for a hospital environment. Okay. And there was another question related to security. I think we kind of referenced it before, but um, I know our audience at Health Spaces, we've actually run some roundtables on facilities leaders role in cybersecurity. Um, so Eric, you know, with all these connected devices, um, are, you know, what are you doing again back on security? And do you feel that this is something that should be more of a growing concern for facilities leaders um, to be, uh, I guess, on top of cybersecurity? Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. Everyone should be, uh, especially if you're a leader in the organization, um, you know, on top of security awareness training that we do. You know, as IoT expands, um, yeah. you know, if that platform and the footprint expands, hackers are going to see that and say, OK, now I've got a bigger picture to fry here so I can start mm -hmm. attacking this and find different ways of doing things. I mean, some of it's just good hygiene and good practices, best practices, you know, password security seems to be still an issue these days. But yeah. um, surprisingly enough, um, you know, I think if as long as you're implementing, uh, you know, the latest and greatest BLE, um, as long as you're not going too far in the legacy and you and you set some parameters that you should have in your cybersecurity you know, program at your healthcare system, um, you should be in good in good uh, status. Uh, you know, that being said, as this footprint expands, and as Chuck said, it's it's going to expand into the billions as, as it already is. Uh, hackers will start looking at this as a very uh, fundamental attack vector, and and as they do, as I said, right now we're we're focused on eavesdropping and man in the middle. Um, those might expand out. You know, who knows what they they can find? You know, eleven year olds are really smart these days. So yeah. we're, we're trying to focus on um, you know segregation, authentication. Uh, you know, really, really focus on knowing what you have and knowing what it's supposed to talk to. Um, uh, those are the basics I can say that would really help any type of, not just BLE, but any, you know, security platform is, is you can't protect what you don't know about. So first you have to understand what you have, and then you have to understand what it does, and then you can protect it based on that, whether new technologies or it be just, you know, workflow or practice. Um, that's the best I can give in a very short time frame, but. No, that's great. And I'm going to check my 11 year old daughter's iPad later to make sure she's not hacking into any hospitals. <laughs> um, so one one final question here just to wrap up is how much of a benefit would be gained from using Bluetooth embedded lighting as an infrastructure for the sensors and beacons? Um, I guess Kapil or, or, or Chuck, you can probably answer. Well, I, uh, I, I can give you an answer. The the, the one of the biggest hindrances you are now talking about replacing all the lighting in a given infrastructure, right? So uh, if you're not on the cycle of replacing lighting within your hospitals, uh, that cost is going to be prohibitive, right? Uh, so that's uh, one of the, the, the negative factors of uh, having, you know, an, a system implement like that. Uh, I would question why is that necessary? You know, there are certain, we, you know, with our gateways uh, and there are other gateways, I'm not just talking about contact IO, there are other gateways uh, that are Bluetooth standard out in the industry that are uh, not that expensive, right? Those are, those are relatively easier to, easier to install uh, and does the same job, right? So I would yeah. consider that um, also. Yeah, I'd say that just just to quickly on touch on that, you know, there have been a number of companies and, and it really does depend on on sort of the deployment that's happening and, and whether yeah. or not it's a retrofit or it's a new new facility uh, deployment uh, where we have a number of companies that have talked about and, and are utilizing the lighting infrastructure as that grid for the beacon network. Uh, and many of those are because they have they're using Bluetooth for the network lighting control and then they're utilizing those sensors or that that deployment to deliver the grid that that uh, that Kapil is talking about, but it, again, it's going to come in many different forms, and, and really, it does depend on the the deployment and the stage of deployment that you're in right. for your for your facility, and and that's the great thing about the flexibility of the technology is that it really depends on the the facility, it depends on where you are in your deployment, and and your ability to to tailor the deployment based on the needs of your organization. And, and that's, and even Eric was talking about the, the thought that 
they're continuing to expand their solution as they go along. And it's those kinds of that kind of thinking around how can I continue to best utilize this technology for multiple functions that give you as the, the economies of scale and the efficiencies and and a lot of the, mm-hmm. the, the, the best practices that you might want to develop and deliver into your organization. Great. Well, it's like we, Legos. We are, we are a little bit of over time here, but I guess the good thing is, is that this will be on demand as well. So people do have to say goodbye and you want to come back. You can watch this on demand, invite the whole family to, to watch it on Friday night. <laughs> um, but the question that we always like to ask is, you know, everyone likes to think about the future. So, Chuck, if I can ask you to put on your futurist hat um, for Bluetooth, you know, where do you see 10 years out from now kind of the the future of Bluetooth, if you can kind of share with share with that? And that may well, seem far out, but. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fair it's a, a fair question. And, and just in terms of the, the, the long term scope for the technology is to continue to expand in those solution areas that I was talking about uh, earlier and providing the flexibility and the functionality for uh, solutions like what uh, Kapil is is talking about and what Eric is actually implementing in order to make sure that they, the, the solution is continues to go lower power, uh, it goes uh, um, higher speed potentially in the terms of data transfer capabilities. Uh, but ultimately it's it's how do you continue to to repurpose and use the technology in in expanded functions within your uh, within your organization. And so when I look at the technology, I just look at the continued flexibility of the technology to be able to tailor to the needs of a particular organization. Uh, and such that a, an organ, a company like uh, like uh, Contact IO can take the technology and deliver it, the the right solution for the right application for the for the organizations themselves, and that's kind of where I see the, the the future of the technology really going is in that flexibility and the delivery of the features and functionality that are necessary for these different organizations. Wonderful. Well, listen, I want to thank you all for for joining us on today's episode. I think this was super insightful. I apologize. There were some more questions in there. Um, if anything, I'll, I will surface them to, 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 the, to the guests here um, and maybe we can come back and, and send you some, some responses. But um, if you have not, please download the market report from Bluetooth that's in the in the chat. And of course, you can go to contact IO to learn about what their organization is. And thank you so much, Eric, for, for joining us to talk about um, your IoT journey. So thank you, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank thank you. you to Bluetooth. Um, for for sponsoring this episode and for for bringing uh, all this great content. Really, uh, I learned a lot and I hope everyone that's tuned in today learned a lot as well. I'm sure you did. And uh, here's time for a shameless plug. Health Spaces Live is coming up in a few more weeks, October 24th to the 26th in Palm Springs, California. Um, For some context there, that's uh, some palms, people hanging out, having a meal. There's somebody on a microphone talking. But on the right-hand side is Stephen Clasco. He is the CEO of Jefferson Healthcare. He's our opening keynote speaker. An intimate retreat in Palm Springs for healthcare facilities, design, construction, and operations leaders. We're limiting it just to about 200 people. Um, so if you'd like to come out and get out in person, not on a screen, and connect with people and talk about the future of healthcare facilities, um, we still have a few spots. So you can go to healthspacesevent.com. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll have another webcast coming up in a few weeks. Hope to see you again. Take care.